Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Nehemiah 4, and we are in Acts 14. <laughs> this is exciting stuff. Let's pray. Let's go. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for truth. Thank you for giving us um, day by day more and more of it. Lord, we pray that you'd open our hearts to believe, but also to be transformed by your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when Sanballat, you know who he is, don't you? Sanballat, the horrible knight. Um, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? <laughs> Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Yes, <laughs> what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, it will break down their stone wall. Here... O oh, our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land. Give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. That's obviously that's them saying, Lord, do to them what they are wanting to be done to us. Um, do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall. And to all and all that wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. Now, just saying, but that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. To have a mind to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were asking a question. Then. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and, then, and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God, and set a guard as protection against them day and night. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because then they didn't just pray and say, Oh, Lord, defend us. But we're going to go to bed and sleep. And they prayed, believing that God could defend them. Don't bite your fingernails. And they believed that they would have to set a guard. So they believed that God was sovereign and that they were responsible to, oh Lord, please protect us. You alone can defend us. You're sovereign, you're in charge. You're the one who answers prayer and you can protect us. And obviously we're responsible to set a guard. We can't be irresponsible. Just because you believe in God should not make you irresponsible, should it? If you believe in God's sovereignty in the Bible, you should also believe in our responsibility because true Christian belief in God does not make you a fatalist. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a difference. So Christian people say, Lord, keep us safe on the roads, um, but I'm also going to take care as mm -hmm. I drive. I'm not going to drive recklessly. I'm not going to be careless. I'm going to try to do what I can do. And that's very different from the attitude in some religions. Mm -hmm. So some religions have such a strange view of God's sovereignty. Um, they, they might say something like, if God wills it, it will happen. Um... And therefore, we can just drive like crazy people and have lots of accidents. And, oh, well, God must have willed it. Well, no. 
God allowed you to experience your own stupidity. Mm. Sorry. If you drive like a madman and have an accident, uh, you can't blame God and say, well, God willed it. I mean, yes, God allowed it. Mm. But you're responsible. And if you're trying to understand the balance between God's sovereignty and human responsibility, don't try to pit them against each other. Spurgeon said, I've long since ceased trying to reconcile friends. You don't try to reconcile people who are not enemies. And he said, well, God's sovereignty is not the enemy of man's responsibility. Um, so don't try to fix it philosophically. Mm. Just understand that this is what the Bible teaches. God is sovereign. We are responsible. And we're going to see that some more today. Mm -hmm. um, but this is good. You know, our forefathers embraced this doctrine. So when um, Oliver Cromwell was leading his men, uh, he picked up on this doctrine of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And he said, trust in God and keep your powder dry to his troops. Well, that meant trust in God and don't let your gunpowder get wet. Because you can't say... Well, that's God's fault if mm. you let it get wet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, verse 10. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop their work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the office, officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows and coats of mail. And the leaders stood beside, behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each laboured on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. They had the sword, and they also had the trowel. <laughs> <laughs> That's the origin of the magazine started by mm -hmm. Uncle Spurgeon, Charlie Boy. He started a magazine called The Sword and Trowel, based on this. Mm. Trust in God and keep your powder dry. Take the sword and also keep going with your work. Mm -hmm. All right, um, where was I? Verse 18, and each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we laboured at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. Mm. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night, and may labour by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Wow. This guy was brave, wasn't he? He says, we're gonna, this is the right thing to do. 
This is what God wants us to do. This is hard. This is, in, the people are kind of intimidating us, but we're going to do it. I like Nehemiah. Mm. Oh, there we are. Well, let's um, turn to Acts 14. Acts chapter 14. Another wonderful verse. Mm -hmm. Opens Acts 14. Which is going to lead us into a very interesting insight <laughs> into God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. This is one of my favourite passages to turn to for that very thing. <laughs> Acts chapter 14. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Okay, stop there. Hold on a minute. Wait! He's talking about people being saved. He's talking about Paul and those with him going into the synagogue. Now, did you notice the connection? They spoke in such a way that... A great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. So there was a connection between the way in which they spoke and people being saved. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, what's the problem there, Tom? Well, there's no problem. But if you turn back to Acts chapter 13 for a moment, in verse 48, mm -hmm. it says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. Oh, hold on a minute. Appointed to eternal life. That's God's sovereignty in salvation. That's God's sovereignty to elect, to choose people to be saved. But now here there's something in chapter 14, verse 1, and it's talking about a connection between the way in which Paul and the others spoke and the number of people who were saved. So what is it? Is it God's sovereignty in salvation or is it our responsibility in salvation? And you know what the answer is? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. So God is sovereign. It's as many who are appointed to eternal life. But God uses means. He chooses to use the way people speak to lead to others being saved. So can you sit back and you say, oh, God is sovereign, so I don't, have to be, I don't have to worry about how I present the gospel to people. I don't have to worry about trying really hard to prepare sermons. I don't have to worry about sp the way in which I share the gospel with my family. It's not up to me. It's just up to God. If he's going to save them, he'll save them. That's it. No, that's fatalism. Mm -hmm. And that's a a wrong view of God's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection here in verse 1 in chapter 14 between the way in which they spoke and the number of people that were saved. Mm -hmm. And so you say, hey, when you come to this verse as a preacher or if you come to this verse as a someone who's trying to share the gospel with others, you say, oh, I really, really must try hard to and ask God to help me and learn how to speak effectively mm. and to communicate the gospel accurately. And, and I can accept that there's a connection between that and the number of people who are saved. And at the same time, you go back to chapter 13 and verse 48 and you say, but actually it's still God who's sovereign in salvation. It's as many as are appointed to eternal life who believe. It's not all up to me. It is actually God who saves. So it's not like God leaves us out, but it is like God includes us. And, and that's an amazing comfort and a terrifying reality at the same time. Yeah. Okay, verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. 
But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. <laughs> Isn't it great? They're so bold, aren't they? Did you notice that in verse 2 and verse 3? Mm-hmm. So in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Verse 3, so they remained for a long time speaking boldly. It's mm-hmm. like people are lying about us. People are making people believe horrible things about us. Oh, no, let's run away and give up and hide and cry. No. <laughs> let's remain a long time and speak boldly. <laughs> Verse 8. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use both, could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. Is it the fridge making that noise? Okay. Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles and Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, "Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we." W- we bring you good news that you should turn turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, and he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. And when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went with Barnabas to Derby, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Now, if you get to the end of this chapter, which we've just done, you've just got to the end of Paul's first missionary journey. Did you notice that? They came back to 
Antioch. It was a round trip. A return ticket. Hmm. All of Paul's missionary journeys were on a return ticket, apart from the last last one. Last one to Rome, yes. But if you find the map, find, find the map of Paul's missionary journeys, and, and you look at the first missionary journey, very helpful, you can see Paul set out from Antioch. Remember where Antioch is? Mm -hmm. Yep. Where did he go next? Cyprus. Oh, when he made his way across Cyprus, remember um, the conversion of the governor? Mm -hmm. And then he went up to Italia. He went up to Perga, sorry. And then he went up to Antioch in Pisidia. And then he went to Iconium and Lystra and Derby. From Derby, he went all the way back to Italia. Back up on himself. Mm -hmm. Back to Antioch. Back to Italia and then sailed back to I didn't go by a side Antioch. Just went straight across. Okay. So now we're going to see in the future this, the second missionary journey. He's going to make his way a, a different route, but we'll mm. cover that. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, that's quite a journey, isn't it? It's a bit of a round trip. A lot of toing and froing. Did you notice that the one thing he said when he was commending all these people to God? Um, verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples. Encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, mm -hmm. we must enter the kingdom of God. Um, that's really something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Paul was a good example of that. He lived it, many tribulations. But he was strengthening them, saying that. I think there is something strength, strengthening. Listen to this. That there's something strengthening about being told that yes, we have to go through many tribulations. Why is that strengthening? Why is it? Why is it that we need to know that and to be strengthened? We need to be realistic, don't we? That's what we've told you from from the first days that we I mean, we start off by started off just by explaining the gospel to you. But as soon as you were old enough to understand it, we said, look, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to be willing to suffer for him. Because if you don't understand that, you can't understand what Jesus said when he said you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. And that's what he said, isn't it? He said if, if you're unwilling to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him, you can't be his disciple. So you can't be a Christian unless you're willing to go through tribulations, unless you're willing to go through trouble for Jesus. And so when we present the gospel to people like Paul, we have to warn them, look, if you're committing to Jesus, you've got to be willing to go through trouble. You've got to be willing to die even for Jesus, if, that, if that's what the Lord called upon for you to do. So um, this is helpful because it's realistic. Mm -hmm. I, I, it terrifies me. I don't know how some of you who watch this, how you heard the gospel, but it terrifies me when I hear people present the gospel in a way where it's kind of, it's not really the gospel. It's like you come to Jesus and, and God... God wants you to live your best life now. God wants you to be the best that you could be. God wants you to, to enjoy prosperity and um, health and wealth. And, and so God just wants the best for you. So come to Jesus. And, and yes, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Uh, so you can, you can have all of this. And it's like, well, 
to start with, where in all of that do you have to repent? Mm. But then, also, there's a problem, isn't there? If that's ha what you came to Jesus for, mm. if you came to Jesus because you thought things were going to get better, if you followed God, you'd be all that you could be. You'd be who God made you to be. And then along comes trouble, which it will. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. That's a lot of trouble. So if, if you came expecting blessing and you, what you're experiencing is trouble, then you can go away thinking, you know, this is not what I signed up for. Mm. Those are exactly the words, tragic words, that I have heard mm -mm. on a number of occasions. This is not what I signed up for. Like pliable in... Um, Say again? Like pliable in Pilgrim's Progress. Pliable in, in Pilgrim's Progress, yeah. I mean, some people get married, they think, I'm just, I'm going to become a Christian and have a lovely Christian wife and I'm going to get married and it's all going to be lovely and then they get married and it's hard. Mm -hmm. And they say, this is not what I signed up for. Oh, I thought I was going to have a nice Christian husband. Actually, it's hard. Well, okay, <laughs> in this world you shall have tribulation. It's going to be hard, isn't it? It doesn't mean you can't look for a nice husband, a nice wife. It's a good thing to do, be careful. Mm. But look, if you if you encounter tribulation, don't be surprised. Mm -hmm. That's what happens to Christians in this world. So, are you ready for that? Are you signed up for that? Mm -hmm. If you're not signed up for that, you need to reconsider. Because you need to be signed up for it. You need to be saying to the Lord, but just between you and the Lord, Lord, whatever it costs, mm -hmm. I'm following you. Mm. whatever it costs Father I pray that you'd help someone today mm. to come to you truly and surrender and trust thank you that you are able to carry us through even the worst of the troubles mm. that, that exist for us in this life help us to be faithful and to follow you all the way in Jesus name Amen Amen all right, God bless you. We're done for today. May the Lord bless you. And hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow. And we'll say goodbye.